Okay, well, welcome uh, to another Solanesis seminar online this Friday. And today I'm glad to introduce Loretta Freitas. She is a bachelor at biological um, science from Pontificia Universidade Católica do Rio Grande do Sul and PhD at genetics and molecular biology from Universidad Federal do Rio Grande do Sul. Currently, she is a full professor and principal investigator at Laboratory of Plant Molecular Evolution, Department of Genetics at the Universidad, Fe Universidad de Federal de Rio Grande do Sul. And she has published more than 100 full papers. She has experience in genetics, focusing on plant genetics and systematics of flowering plants, especially phylogenetics, phylogeography, and genetic diversity. So now Loretta will show us her work on the evolutionary and, and evolutionary history and genetic diversity of petunias. Um, with that, I will um, just leave you with her that she's going to share uh, the screen and start presenting. So thank you, Loretta, for being with us today. Oh, thank you, Rocio. Thank you all for being here today and a special thanks to all organizers for these seminars and the opportunity to show some results uh, obtained uh, at my lab and especially to my students and former students that produce these results. And I was uh, like to thank Dr. João Renato Steman, my friend and colleague that uh, introduced me to this amazing world in Solanacea. Thank you, everyone. Let me share my, my screen here. Okay, I think it is now working. Oh, please uh, be completely comfortable to advise me about uh, the some uh, troubles uh, in this presentation. Okay. Well, uh, the phylogenetic position of Petunia is uh, in this uh, tribe, Petuni. Uh, forming a clade with the Calibracoa and Fabiana, and this clade diverged circa 25 million years ago. And the separation uh, in between Petunia and Calibracoa was circa uh, the eight and a half million years ago, and the, the divergence in species in this genus was circa one and a half million years ago. This result uh, were published by Sarkini and uh, her colleagues. Until uh, 1985, all species uh, that looks like petunia uh, and uh, now uh, form the genera petunia and calibracoa were under petunia name. But uh, it changed uh, in uh, 1986 when the chromosome numbers divided the species in two groups. Uh, Calibracoa species have uh, nine chromosomes and the petunia, because petunia hybrid, uh, have uh, seven uh, chromosome numbers. And here we have some pictures from Jean Renate Steman thesis, a PhD thesis, that describes several other characteristics that support these two genera, like uh, habitats. Uh, uh, Calibracoa species are predominantly shrubs and petunia are herbs. But uh, leaf anatomy, coral estivation, seed coat, and calyx are completely different in both uh, groups of species. The petunia genus is a small genus uh, in Solanation, popularly known through the commercial hybrid, petunia hybrida that is one of the most important ornamental species that move in more than $25 million per year uh, commercializing seeds and seedlings. And uh, this is uh, some uh, pictures that I took uh, when travel through 
uh, North Hemisphere, uh, where these uh, species are very, very popular and so beautiful. We recognize that uh, they, they are amazing, really amazing. But Petunia is a, a genus that is endemic to the South America, where occupy open fields and rock outcrops. And the wild species are annual and herbous plants that grow in varied elevations. Here we present the origin of this, uh, this group that occurs in subtropical grassland, uh, particularly in Pampian region. And uh, you could uh, see this region in the map. And uh, in the right uh, part of this picture, we have uh, the um, resume uh, summary for the phylogeny. Petunia appeared in this uh, grassland steep or steep areas and during the Pleistocene climatic cycles expanded the, the distribution during glacial periods and contracted this distribution during interglacial cycles. And we think that uh, these changes in uh, expansion and contractions during this period promote diversification and speciation in this group, especially in highlands. Currently, some taxa reach the Subandian region in Argentina, and one taxon only can be found in tropical highland grasslands in Brazil. The rest are most species occur in the Pampa domain and or uh, subtropical highland grasslands, especially in Brazil. The uh, genus ancestral displayed uh, purple flowers, blue pollen, short corolla tube, and was bipollinated. This ancestral uh, inhabited uh, the lowland grasslands in Pampa and secondarily migrated to the north, diversifying the air and colonizing medium and high elevations. Here we have a, a picture with uh, several uh, flowers from uh, each uh, species uh, recognizing this uh, group. In Brazil, we have uh, 16 uh, taxa because we have some subspecies in uh, some uh, species. In Uruguay, we can find uh, eight taxa and six in Argentina. In Paraguay, we have uh, records for two or three different species. Uh, this um, Elevations uh, in where uh, Petunia occurs uh, varies uh, from the sea level until more than 1,000 uh, meters high. The most recent inclusive phylogenetic tree for the genus divided the species in two main clades according to the corolla uh, tube uh, length. Short corolla tube that is uh, there is more species with this morphology and the long corolla tube clades that there is only four species uh, there and uh, one accession is for occidentalis that uh, like the another group has a short corolla tube but it's a session in this clade and uh, we think that this is a reversion to the con ancestral conditions because of the colonization, the area that uh, this species occurs is uh, a secondary colonization for the genes. And uh, this uh, shift is in place to send climate, climate equally impact impacted both clades uh, diversification process, but ecological constraints uh, were completely different in each group. Uh, the Pleistocene effect uh, affected uh, distribution, like this example, it is uh, for Petunia axillaris subspecies axillaris, that during the league or last interglacial period, circa 102,000 uh, years ago, uh, presented a very contracted uh, distribution that expanded during the colder weather and during the last glacial maximum and uh, during the Holocene it contracted again, but less than the first period 
and uh, the current distribution for this uh, tax uh, taxon is close to the suitable areas during the Holocene. Uh, for all species in Petunia, similar patterns were found. We modeled the distribution for all of them. And uh, we found that expansion during the colder and drier periods and contraction when the climate got warmer and wetter. But the Pleistocene affect also morphology and uh, genetic variability. Here we have uh, two examples. And uh, in one, uh, this uh, effect promotes speciation, like this subtro subtropical highland grassland species. And uh, for other species, uh, the changes in climate produce phylogeographical lineages as the South Atlantic coastal plain, this endemic uh, uh, subspecies for Petunia integrifolia. When we look for the conservation of a niche, ecological niche for this species, uh, we could uh, uh, have some uh, similar situations for all of them. In this work, uh, we evaluated the niche conservatism and observed that uh, genetic variability in Petunia was more limited by precipitation variables with a weak or known impact of elevation and temperature over time. And in the right uh, uh, part of this picture, we have uh, the network for plastid diversity in all petunia species. And we can uh, see that all of them uh, had a recent expansion in uh, variability. The long corolla tube uh, was more affected by interaction between species and their pollinators. And in this group, we have this high uh, differentiation uh, between species and uh, morphology and pollinators are uh, concurring to this speciation. So we uh, think that uh, the pollinators drove the this interaction uh, drove the speciation in this group. For the short corolla tube, we have only bee pollinated species and morphology is so similar uh, in these flowers. Of course, we have a difference that uh, allow us to split the species and identify each one, but they are so similar and adapted to this um, this interaction with pollinator. One detail that uh, I think is very, very interesting uh, here is the pollen color. These three species uh, are uh, pollinated by hawk moths, bees, or uh, hummingbirds, and all of them have uh, yellow pollen. Here we have different uh, bees pollinating these uh, plants that uh, have. Uh, uh, blue pollen. And in this group, we think that the soil was the most important uh, factor to promoting speciation because each species occurs in different landscapes and uh, soil is completely different. About the genetic diversity, we have uh, the impact of the Pleistocene also when diverse, uh, genetic diversity mostly related with the distribution range and environmental heterogeneity. And here we have the two examples when uh, we have uh, different uh, ecologies in biomes, Chaco and Pampa, and we have uh, two independent groups according to the uh, genomes. And uh, the second part of this uh, picture show uh, to you that uh, the comparison between widely distributed and microendemic species that we have uh, just a, a few uh, differences uh, here, only plastic uh, uh, aplotypes that uh, we have uh, largely uh, orange uh, species distributed uh, from Uruguay to uh, Brazil along the coast. 
and uh, we have a lot of different haplotypes and uh, this microendemic species are located in the yellow dots in the, the three uh, square in the in this map that is very restrict distributed and uh, the diversity is very very low and uh, the quantity of individuals and populations we are related, of course, uh, this uh, microendemic uh, species has just a few populations, much uh, less than uh, widely distributed, but uh, the number of individuals analyzed the, here uh, are similar. Well, I would like to show you some uh, pictures, um, general overview about uh, geographic distribution, these species, because they are gorgeous and uh, deserve to be seen and uh, the landscape that each one occupies. So this is uh, the only one petunia that I never seen alive. Uh, this picture was uh, sent to me for a friend that cultivated it uh, in a greenhouse in Petunia occidentalis. Uh, there is a very restricted uh, distribution, uh, just these blue stars uh, in this map and uh, Jujuy and South provinces in Argentina. Uh, where occupy these medium to high elevations in very, very arid soils. Uh, these uh, species uh, were collected uh, very, very few samples. And uh, I have just one sample from our herbarium uh, DNA. Uh, I could uh, use this to, to prepare the phylogeny, but uh, only this, never more. And the several colleagues from Argentina have searched for this species for me and uh, couldn't find it. Well, uh, the second uh, species, it, uh, I uh, prepared this according their clades and it's a Brazilian uh, only uh, species. It's uh, Petunia excerta that occupied this area in central of Rio Grande do Sul, the Brazilian state uh, where I live. And it's uh, South, uh, uh, South, uh, Southern South America. And uh, this landscape is very uh, atypical. And uh, we have these rock towers and uh, it's uh, um, inhospitable uh, soil for all other petunias and this species of course inside caves in these rocks towers in the middle of the pampa and uh, you could uh, see the very uh, poor soil that they grow. Another endemic species is petunia secreta uh, this is a bee pollinated species that occurs in another rock formation close to the Pexerta, uh, Petunia excerta distribution that uh, is called the Pedra do Segredo. And uh, it does not occur inside caves. It uh, grows in sunny uh, places, but the arid soils. Petunia axillaris is a very uh, large, has a very large distribution. Uh, now it is divided in three subspecies. Each one occupies uh, different regions, but they occur uh, in open fields and uh, low to high elevations in sunny areas. Uh, here we have uh, more details about each one. Petunia axillaris subendina occurs in uh, Subiandis area. And uh, this example is uh, plants for on Cordoba, Argentina, and uh, the area that uh, it occupies in very uh, arid soils also and uh, high elevation. Petunia axillaris axillaris, uh, this example is from Casapava do Sul, uh, close to the distribution of Petunia excerta and secreta in the Pampian uh, domain. It occurs only in the Pampa, but it occurs in Argentina and uh, Uruguay also. It 
doesn't grow inside the caves, uh, only outside the caves on top or faces of these towers, and but um, mainly in this uh, field close to the towers. And uh, Parodai, uh, it's a example of, example from Uruguay. Uh, this is a subspecies occupy two different regions, uh, grasslands regions, but Pampa and Chaco. And uh, this example is from Taquarembó. It's a region in Uruguay. Another uh, endemic species from Brazil, Petunia mantiqueirensis, uh, it occurs uh, in uh, Minas Gerais, Brazilian state. These uh, blue circles uh, are represented uh, in this map. And it's the only one species that occurs in this distribution is the uh, border of the genus distribution, northern border. And it's only one species of Petunia that occurs in island tropical fields, uh, very high elevation, more than 1,000 meters. Uh, here we have uh, three of the species that occurs in subtropical highland grasslands in Brazil. Uh, the three species are endemic uh, to Brazil and are closely related to distribution, but they occur, uh, they each one occurs in different elevations, Bonjardinensis, Heights, and Saxicola that occur in this amazing uh, landscape uh, full of canyons in Brazil. And Altiplana is another uh, highland uh, uh, grassland uh, species that are uh, uh, widely distributed in the two Brazilian states and the environment that uh, these the species uh, could be found, uh, find uh, is uh, these uh, open areas closer to this uh, big river, Pelotas River uh, in Brazil. Guarapuavensis and Chaidana are two species, Ron Renato uh, disagree with this classification, but uh, when we produced this phylogeny, we saw that uh, Petunia Guarapuavensis is a valid. Uh, taxon, and uh, we here uh, I, I present the Ando uh, classification for Petunia, Guarapuavensis and Jajana. They occur close uh, to each other yeah, in this region. Uh, Guarapuavensis and describe that uh, occurs also in Paraguay and. Uh, Shaidana, of course, also maybe in Paraguay, but also Argentina and Brazil. Petunia integrifolia has uh, two subspecies. One is uh, typical from uh, these sand soils uh, close to the Atlantic Ocean in the southern uh, Atlantic uh, plain coast. And uh, another is uh, typical from Pampa and occurs in Argentina, Uruguay, and Brazil also in different kinds of fields. It's important to, uh, to say that uh, both areas are part of the Pampa domain. And Bajens is another endemic and uh, very restricted distribution, distributed species in Brazil only, but they occupy these humid and rich soils in the Pampa. And uh, here we have uh, uh, another uh, species, is uh, the name disappeared, but it is Petunia flata that occurs in the Pampa, Uruguay, Brazil, South Brazil, and Argentina. Also in this uh, field is a little bit similar to Bajensis uh, constitution. And uh, here Petunia interior is uh, very similar to uh, Integri uh, Inflata, uh, sorry that they occupy open fields in the Pampa, but uh, differently uh, to in Flata, it occurs in uh, high elevations. 
uh, both are very similar in morphology and share this same pollinator that we have in this picture. And finally, the last one is Petunia Correntina that is endemic to uh, this region in uh, Corrientes, Argentina. Uh, and uh, I, I brought these uh, two pictures here. We take when I visit Corrientes and saw uh, these species. And at that time, I thought it was integrifolia, and I didn't realize it's a new species that now Grappy and Salmon uh, have described it. This is the only one we don't have uh, analyzed to uh, molecular markers yet. So now I would like to show you my five, uh, favorite solanation that uh, I thought to send to our uh, social, uh, social media and decided to present it to you in person. My favorite solanation is Petunia exact and I will try to, to tell you why. Uh, why it's uh, really, really beautiful, but um, it's the only one uh, naturally red petunia. And uh, we uh, studying several uh, general and uh, mark molecular markers. We uh, obtaining data that uh, support uh, that uh, the diver divergence between axillaries and excerta occurred uh, circa the 30,000 um, years ago. And it is a hummingbird pollinated species because uh, it is uh, morphological uh, traits that recently diverged in the, this long coral tube clade. Here we have the um, Heck Cartman phylogeny putting the ancestral morphology, a uh, bee pollinated uh, purple species, probably very similar to current uh, integrifolia, and uh, two other uh, different uh, fl um, uh, floral syndromes. Uh, one, it is a hawk and moth pollinated species, uh, the white uh, axillaries and uh, the red and uh, hummingbird pollinated uh, petunic set. And uh, the Professor Chris Kuleymeyer group has, has a lot of results about the uh, relationships between and transitions uh, uh, among this uh, syndrome, floral syndromes and uh, amazing works about this. And all of them agree with our thoughts uh, about this uh, population evolution and uh, the diversification, the except uh, from axillaries type. Well, uh, Exerta occurs uh, in a rock formation in the middle of the Pampa region in Brazil. Uh, this region uh, represented uh, here by these pictures are Serra do Sudeste, and uh, you could see in this map uh, the region. And uh, it's interesting because Serra do Sudeste uh, extends uh, to Uruguay, uh, North uh, Uruguay, but uh, except it doesn't occur there. Uh, it is endemic to this small region in, uh, in Brazil. And um, individuals in a bit uh, these small shelters like these pictures in the right uh, um, part of this uh, slide and uh, in these towers. Uh, where they grow up uh, protected from direct sunlight and the rain. And they stay side by side, very close to each other. And many times we have just a few individuals like this right uh, part and uh, or a lot of individuals like this left part. 
we are studying uh, studying this species for a long time, especially because we find a, a huge morphological variation, especially in color. Uh, that can be a product of poly natural polymorphism or hybridization with the uh, between axillaries from the same region because the yogurt is very, very close. And we know that uh, at least in uh, uh, house experiments, uh, all petunias can cross and produce fertile hybrids. Morphological and genetic polymorphisms in Exerta were first described in uh, 2006. We started to a uh, little bit early to study this species. But at that time, uh, we found that these uh, plants inside, only inside shelters in the Arenite rock towers, with the axillaries growing outside the same shelters in the same towers. And uh, like this uh, cartoon, you can see uh, morphological polymorphism inside the shelters, like pink and red flowers and the white flowers outside. And looking at this top, uh, we have uh, different flowers collected in the same shelter. All of them uh, we analyze it, and the morphology is only for. Um, morphology and the polymorphism is not related to genetics in that work produced in 2006 please and here we have this network for plastid haplotypes but in that time we know only four populations of exerta for this region and uh, even we search for more, uh, we couldn't find it. And but it uh, changed. And now the this uh, work produced uh, in uh, 2014, we have a color and shape variation combining with the genetic ancestry throughout the entire geographic distribution. And at uh, that time uh, we have. Uh, 35 populations find in different shelters and different towers in the region along the full region. And uh, almost 400 individuals uh, genotyped by these markers. And uh, uh, these individuals uh, were analyzed based on the genetic markers from nuclear uh, nuclear markers and the plastic markers. And our um, aim in this, our goal in this work was establish or study the population structure and the genetic variability in this uh, species and try to combine this uh, morphological variation the top, uh, left top of this picture. And we use these markers, uh, named CAPs, uh, cleavage the amplified polymorphic sequences, and plastid sequences forming haplotypes and uh, profile, genetic profile for both. Nuclear markers produced only two genetic components, and uh, several individuals displayed mixed ancestry. And you can see this red one and uh, the green that is the most frequent observed in etc. The uh, haplotypes, uh, uh, plastic haplotypes, were a little bit more diverse than uh, uh, nuclear markers. But uh, both data sets showed uh, low uh, genetic variability in this species and did not reveal the population structure according to the spatial distribution in this area. Here we have a, a representation of this uh, per individual collected. It's just a, a few sample of these uh, individuals. And you can see uh, in this bottom uh, picture for the morphology, one individual is very similar to canonical morphology of uh, Exerta. And you can see that 
it uh, has uh, both uh, genetic components and uh, the same plastid that the rest of the sample. And uh, in the middle, we have a different color and morphology that is represented by an uh, individual that uh, is homogeneous, uh, has only one genetic profile, a nuclear genetic profile, but it, uh, share with the first one the same haplotype. And the last one is uh, uh, similar but uh, uh, to the first, but has more the second genetic component. And we frequently found individuals displaying different morphologies with the same plastic haplotype and different nuclear ancestry. But we have all combinations in these uh, three uh, comparisons, uh, and, uh, but they, are, uh, they have uh, lower frequencies. Morphology in this case, in this study, was not a good indicator of ancestry and the changes in color did not mean hybridization in this sampling, but uh, it was in this work with these markers. It's changed with the, the time, over the time. This uh, is uh, the most recent uh, uh, work we have. Uh, using uh, microsatellites and we characterized a lot of different uh, shelters and towers uh, throughout the distribution in this area that uh, uh, Serra do Sudeste, but uh, the popular name is Guaritas. And uh, in this work, we analyzed only 15 natural populations of Exerta and uh, almost 400 individuals. Uh, but uh, in this case, uh, we included only populations for which uh, we no hybridization signs we have. Uh, no hybridizations in another uh, works. Uh, we included only this, we consider poor bred, uh, except oh, canonical, uh, genetics, uh, canonical genome, uh, not necessarily morphology, uh, because morphology changes a lot uh, in this species. We found four genetic components uh, now here using this marker, markers, uh, most of them largely distributed uh, along the, this area. Uh, we found uh, also high inbreeding uh, levels uh, for this species and the low gene flow between populations along uh, across uh, the distribution. And uh, the genetic diversity was very low uh, comparing the, with the other petunia species with uh, higher or widely distributed. Several individuals we have here in this structure uh, analysis uh, showed uh, mixed ancestry, uh, including different genetic components that we think is naturally uh, occur in Exerta. Uh, here we have uh, two uh, works that use uh, morphometric uh, geometric morphometric uh, analysis for uh, Petunia exerta comparing with axillaris. But here in these works, we use only two sites uh, where we know that uh, the population are mixed. So uh, considering, considering uh, hybridization as a source for this uh, polymorphic uh, morphology in uh, exact, and uh, we are comparing with axillaris. In these both works, we evaluated the genetic and morphological variation uh, among uh, petonic set individuals from two mixed populations and compare it uh, with the uh, axillaris purebred and uh, no uh, variation in morphology and 
these putative hybrids that uh, we consider all individuals that were not red and not white as hybrids. And uh, we uh, found that uh, Petonique Certa has natural morphological polymorphism and uh, how to you see in this uh, left part in this graphic, we have uh, different uh, morphologies and the genetics components in this uh, species. And hybrids display intermediate shape between both species, between axillaris and exceptum. Uh, the uh, blue dots are uh, represent uh, the uh, the dark one represent the uh, axillaries and the light ones uh, represent uh, the hybrids. Well, uh, some hybrids uh, genetic profiles considering microsatellites uh, present in these two mixed populations present a, a, a huge variation in their components. Here in this uh, fig, we have uh, uh, represented in red, all uh, genetics uh, components from exeter and in blue axillaries. Uh, not necessarily, uh, the hybrids not necessarily uh, were uh, a mix it. Um, many times we have a hybrid that uh, present only red or only a blue component. In this study, we have only microsatellites analysis. And uh, in this left hand, we have uh, five uh, kinds of hybrids we can find, and we classify it according the color. Uh, like these uh, circles, uh, colored circles you have uh, in this left part of this figure. But uh, look that uh, a lot of uh, variation we have inside each class. And we have uh, different uh, shades and uh, special morphology. So hybrid color varies more than parental species and shapes too. In this, uh, another work uh, looking at the entire distribution and considering contact and isolated uh, populations of both species. Now, the first one I, I show you, uh, we look only no hybridization and uh, the second uh, uh, part is looking for hybridization and then now we consider both together. And in this case, the distribution is more restricted because we don't have uh, uh, many uh, shelters or towers uh, where we can find uh, contact uh, area, contact zone for two species. And even if we don't have uh, um, individuals that we can certify that they are hybrids. So uh, it uh, reduces our sampling. Here we obtained the morphology in the top and uh, microsatellites uh, on the bottom and uh, isolated populations of both species perfectly match taxonomic classification, axillaris or exerta, morphology characteristic uh, from each one and is parcel distribution uh, inside or outside the shelters. And individuals from the contact populations not necessarily, necessarily uh, and were not always intermediate between canonical morphology of this, uh, this species, even morphology, even color. When we look for uh, genetic polymorphisms, individuals are distributed in three clusters. One is typical uh, to axillaris and almost all axillaris individuals present this uh, genetic component. 
and two different uh, groups of uh, excerpt and the hybrids are distributed inside both. Uh, this work uh, now is, uh, uh, it was published at the last year, but now it's uh, press uh, in uh, the journal and uh, we have uh, analyzed the uh, uh, genome wide coverage for uh, both uh, isolated and contact areas and using GBS um, technique uh, to identify SNPs. And uh, in this work, we used 6,000 SNPs, uh, BLLIC SNPs to analyze it and model it, uh, the uh, evolutionary history for this area, considering the both isolated and uh, co-occurring uh, populations of axillaries and uh, exact. And uh, we found that in both neutral and adaptive uh, genomic variation from uh, contact areas or mixed set populations is stated the uh, scenario of uh, divergence uh, with a, a recent secondary contact. Hybridization between these two species uh, occurs uh, asymmetrically, predominantly from axillaries to exact. And uh, we have a lot of information about crosses from other authors, other works that show that uh, uh, when uh, Exerta is the mother plant, uh, uh, the crosses are more successful. Genetic drift and the preferential crossing between relatives or self-fertilization decrease at the zygosity and the genetic variability in these populations, especially in Exerta, and promote the interspecific lineage divergence and the reproductive isolation for them, preserving the uh, limits between the species. And uh, to concluding uh, about uh, this amazing uh, species, Petunic Certa was, uh, uh, has a low genetic diversity independently, which uh, marker we use it to uh, evaluate it. And uh, homozygous excess uh, is very um, impressive compared with other uh, species in Petunia. Genetic and morphological integrity uh, in Exerta are maintained despite uh, the hybridization, natural hybridization with axillaries. And integration can explain part of floral polymorphism. The rest of polymorphism is maybe a natural uh, variation in these species because uh, only few contact zones and a few hybrid populations we find. Morphology has played an important role uh, in the species isolation because of the pollinators' preferences. Uh, hummingbirds for exerta and the uh, hawk moth for, for axillaries, but if we don't know uh, uh, which one produces the hybrids. And another thing that we needed to evaluate is uh, the bees, because bees occur there and we don't know what they do. Uh, the revergent uh, microenvironments contribute to species differentiation because we have uh, some SNPs under selection in this uh, sampling uh, of these uh, genomes. And uh, except uh, of course, in a very different uh, environment than axillaries that uh, grow outside the shelters. And the landscape microhabitat uh, features contribute to pollen flow that occurs mainly inside the shelter through jatonogamy or bee parental inbreeding. These mating strategies uh, could have facilitated the colonizations like we uh, listened the last uh, Friday. And adaptations to accept uh, to a new environment for the genus um, uh, it is uh, very uh, significant. 
And uh, if you remember last week, we listened that uh, populations uh, that are colonizing new environments uh, tend to be self-compatible. And we have this uh, information about the Exerta and about uh, axillaries from the Guaritas region, differently than another um, populations in axillaries. So I would like to thank you for being here. Obrigada a todos. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this uh, presentation and understand that why Exerta is my favorite solanation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Loretta. That was great. It was a really great talk. Um, so now we are open to questions. And in first place, we have a question of uh, Patricia Bellinger. She's here. Probably she wants to do it directly. Oh, OK. Let me put my camera on, too. Hello. Oh, that was so beautiful. That was just lovely. I can see Thank why you. you love that species so much. Thank and you. of course, I'm going to ask you about mating systems <laughs> because you know I would. And I just, and I know that um, petunias are generally self incompatible, but I wondered yeah, if there are some self compatible species or populations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Petunia exerta is self compatible, uh, and uh, we have uh, several. Um, not uh, examples, but uh, several events that uh, it uh, spontaneously produces fruits. And uh, we, we think that it's because uh, when uh, shake the flower, because of the position, the organ's position is uh, impeditive to do this. Mm -hmm. But uh, when we shake the flowers, it, the lots of pollen, uh, falls uh, in this and uh, produces uh, viable fruits and uh, seeds. And uh, axillaries from the same region is self-compatible oh. and uh, Petunia secreta also. Petunia secreta is uh, close to this distribution, but uh, it's also self-compatible. And uh, we have this uh, experience in uh, greenhouse and uh, information from the field and both uh, the three species in this clade are self-compatible. Uh, we don't have the information for uh, other uh, axillaries uh, subspecies, subandina or parodai, but uh, for axillaries, axillaries from this region, Guaritas and the Serra do Sudeste, they are. Oh, that yeah. would be very interesting to study. <laughs> yes, oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Could you could you help us? Yes. <laughs> I'd love to. <laughs> I invited you to come to Brazil and uh, help to us. Uh, to uh, last uh, week, I was uh, completely insane about your uh, work and uh, your <laughs> colleague work, uh, amazing thing. And I was thinking, oh my God, I, I can do this. Well, and, I feel the same way about your work. It's just really beautiful and intriguing. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I should let other people ask questions now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you okay. again. Thank you both. And then we have a question of Kelsey Vallas. Yeah, thanks very much. That was such a cool talk. And I saw Exerta once at Kew Gardens in London, and I was so happy to see it. So happy. It's the best. I wanted to know a little more about Secreta. So it's got this really long Corolla tube, but it's bee yes. pollinated. Is it special yes. long tongued bees or is it regular bees? Uh, no, it is a very small bees. And uh, uh, we have uh, um, a worker with this uh, uh, reproductive uh, details about this species. And uh, we saw that this, uh, this bee only collect pollen. Uh, Secreta produces uh, nectar and a uh, very attractive nectar, but not for them. Uh, they only collect and uh, the bee behavior is very, very interesting because uh, each bee collects all pollen uh, that uh, flower has. 
oh, and remove every uh, pollen grains. And uh, the dynamic for this species is completely different. Uh, and Secreta is an amazing group uh, also, especially because it's a very restricted distributed and have uh, uh, the same uh, genetic uh, variability than the larger one. It is equivalent to axillaris and equivalent to the pauperata that are that uh, have uh, very long distributions, large distribution. And does it's it, uh, very interesting. Does it smell? No. Ah, okay, very cool. Uh, but uh, we characterized that uh, pollen scent and all yellow pollen has uh, the same components and compounds and have a very very different thing we needed to to stress more this system especially about the the pollen uh, scent but uh, it is a uh, very interesting and now we have uh, well, we have uh, hybrids between uh, axillaris and excerta. We know they mm -hmm. there are uh, really exist, but uh, now we are think uh, we are guessing that uh, maybe we have uh, hybrids between secreta and excerta and secreta and axillaris, and yes. Uh, they occur in the same area. They are so related evolutionarily. Uh, Chris Kuhlmeier group characterized the uh, why each one is white, another pink, another red, and we have a lot of information about this. And maybe bees could uh, collect the pollen in all these plants in this area. And now my, uh, I have a PhD student that uh, uh, is working with the crossings and characterizing the several genes and the phenotypes uh, in the artificial, of course, uh, hybrids and uh, the wider species. Oh, that's super cool. Thank you so much. Obrigado. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you both Kelsey and Loretta. Now we have a question of Shannon Sullivan about the hybrid. She here, yeah. Hi, make myself visible. Uh, that was such an interesting talk. Thank you so much. Um, you know, we're in, in uh, the US, we're so familiar with the hybrid taxon and not with the wild species. And um, I had a, an undergrad student do the treatment of petunia for the floor in North America as her senior thesis project. And, um, and I was just so surprised when looking at herbarium specimens at the diversity in the genus, and then especially to see the colors, um, because they change from herbarium specimen colors, er, they, they change from wild colors um, in the herbarium. So thank you so much. It was nice to see all that. Um, and I know that your talk wasn't about the horticultural hybrid, but that's my question. So if, if, you, um, if that's not something that you're able to address, then I'll just let the next person ask their question. But um, I wanted to ask about the nomenclature of the hybrid taxon, the cultivated hybrid taxon, not the wild ones that you're finding. Is that something that you can address or? Uh, no, no. Okay, uh, all right, then. Yeah. Then, and yeah. then I'll just say thank you again. And that was just delightful. It was a lot of fun to see all those colors and shapes and interesting to hear about the hybridization in the field. Thank you to be here. Maybe uh, so, uh, another person could uh, uh, answer your question about the uh, okay. hybrid. And uh, uh, we, we did uh, work characterizing the natural polymorphism in uh, species because we know that uh, axillary is uh, the white parental and uh, the purple, we don't know which one. Uh, and we try because uh, we know the region where they, these wild species were collected 
for the first crosses to produce as a hybrid. And uh, we characterize the, the polymorph genetic polymorphisms in several cultivars that we have in Brazil and uh, the wild species. And uh, our uh, findings uh, um, pointed to Petunia interior. And uh, that is distributed in the area and uh, share polymorphisms with uh, uh, cultivars, but uh, about the nomenclature and uh, uh, the other. Uh, here we have uh, two uh, different kinds of uh, uh, hybrid, uh, the bigger one and the smaller one. And uh, both uh, share the, poly the same polymorphisms. Uh, of course, we just uh, use a neutral uh, microsatellites and uh, plastic uh, markers. But maybe Jean Renato could answer your question or another person audience. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Janet. And also, we have, um, well, there is a lot of congratulations, of course from Sandy Na, from Thibaut Vesquibel, and also from Joao Steinman. Uh, he says, like, thank you for testing his hypothesis based on morphology. And also we have a question of uh, Federico Roda. I think he's here. Hi, uh, very nice talk and, and, and very nice system. I have a, a question which is kind of, of, of general and, and, and philosophical. <laughs> And it's so all, all of us that that have to deal sometimes with species and diversity in the field uh, kind of uh, have sometimes to detect hybrids based on phenotype in morphology. But uh, as you showed a little bit in, in, in your talk, uh, sometimes the traits that distinguish species are polygenic and plastic. So it's not really obvious how a hybrid will look like. And sometimes when we have genetic data, it's actually some, some uh, real hybrids, if you want, <laughs> look like the pure species. So do you think we should uh, prioritize genetic da data to detect hybrids? Or based on your results, do you think it's still fine to, uh, most of the times you get, you get it right when you use the phenotype? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well. Uh... <laughs> Based on my experience, uh, my experience is only for petunias, okay? And uh, so no one alone is able to uh, identify hybrids uh, correctly. And uh, well, all our uh, works uh, were uh, based on populations, not only one individual. And uh, we have, uh, more than the, a distribution of uh, traits in morphology and the genetics and uh, establish uh, the intervals for each one, canonical and uh, hybrids. And uh, in petunias, uh, we needed to, to analyze it all, uh, morphological and uh, genetics uh, to identify through hybrids. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice talk. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Federico. And yeah, there are more congratulations from Nina Caballero, for, of course. And there is a comment of Iris Peralta. Like she says that um, Petunia axillaris, a species of Andina, grows in arid places, such as Pajata Mountains in Mendoza and all of them have white flowers. So it's kind of, yeah. I wonder about that, like probably, like if they, do you think like the, the species with broad distributions probably hybridize with other species as well? Like for example, Petunia axillaris could be realization, be realizing with other species across all the uh, range of distribution of these species. Uh, we don't know. Uh, we don't know if, uh, because uh, axillaries of course, close to uh, inflata and integrifolia, and uh, we have uh, some, but we don't have uh, uh, this 
uh, hybrids or uh, putative hybrids. We, we never saw it, but uh, maybe uh, it's possible because in greenhouse uh, controller, the experiments, all petunias uh, are able to cross uh, each other and produces uh, fruits and the viable seeds. But uh, we never saw in the field. In the field, we have uh, um, uh, things uh, that uh, uh, thoughts that uh, we have uh, hybrids between excreta axillaris, excreta uh, secreta, and secreta axillaris, but uh, not. Uh, I, I not understand the question of. Uh, Professor Iris Peralta about uh, the subangina is all of them uh, white flowers, but uh, yes, uh, we we don't have uh, uh, differences in color in uh, uh, no one subspecies in uh, axillaris. All of them are purely uh, white. The polymorphism is morphological and the color polymorphism is we find in except only. Okay. And Very only nice. inside the caves. No, that just one, I want to add just a comment that Petunia axillaris in Mendoza grows in very arid environments. So it could be an interesting trait for improvement of uh, the cultivated petunias probably. And also in disturbated areas, like uh, close to the roads. So yeah. that means that they need water, but they can tolerate uh, dry places and the lack of water. Yeah. Uh, and all of them are white. Yeah. And, yeah. and just one thing uh, that I also wanted to ask is some of the petunias uh, in the deeper part of the color, corolla, they have like a market veins. Yes. Do you consider that this is an ancestral trait? Uh, it, it, uh, is that, that trait appeared in what, what was uh, called Petunia Patagonica. But yes. we know that it's not the Petunia. But uh, those market pains are present there. So I wonder if it could be an Yeah, but it, but it is not uh, so common. Uh, some individuals show uh, these uh, uh, things, these veins, colored veins, but it's not um, uh, common in all uh, flowers, all species. Uh, it happens. But uh, we have uh, many uh, mutations in uh, populations. We have uh, flowers with uh, transposons. We have uh, flowers with uh, other uh, differences uh, in morphology. But uh, we uh, didn't consider this uh, variation as natural in uh, our studies. Yeah, but uh, Petunia Patagonica, you know, uh, I, I contacted you a long time ago about this. It is a Fabiana, it's not a Petunia. Okay, thank you, that's great. And there is one last question of Thibault. I don't know if he's here or should I read it? About so conservation. Asking, yes, he's asking about conservation status. Some species have very small distribution area, but none are assessed by UEC and red list. Are some of these species threatened? So. Yeah, uh, uh, including here, uh, we have uh, some uh, studies that uh, we uh, uh, applica uh, applied uh, the UCN uh, uh, criteria, and uh, we have. Uh, this uh, treated uh, species of very uh, small distributions and uh, very low genetic variability, just a few individuals uh, each uh, season, but uh, they are not uh, present in a uh, uh, huge uh, list. And uh, in Brazilian list, uh, we have some of uh, these species, including uh, Exerta that uh, 
doesn't deserve to be there because uh, there are a lot of populations, a lot of individuals each uh, year, but um, uh, other species are in this. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think that was the last questions. Um, thank you again for presenting today and share with us this amazing diversity of petunias. Um, well, next week, next Friday, we have um, in, we have another, it's the last uh, seminar of uh, this semester, and it's going to be presented by Joao Stedman and Jenny Paucar. They're going to talk about the structure and function of the petal appendages in a swentia. In swentia. So, well, we, yes, we, we, we are going to have another great seminar next week. And um, thank you everyone for attending. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.